Dr. Tony Daher. Dr. Daher has a master's in medical education at the University of Southern California, postgraduate certification in prosthodontics at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. He's co-director of the Global Dental Implant Academy. He's a prosthodontist and runs his private practice in Laverne, California. He was a former associate professor and a former director of the Advanced Prosthodontics Program at Loma Linda University. And he has written over 50 scientific clinical articles and chapters in textbooks and ebooks, and has lectured over 150 presentations nationally and internationally on the subject of prosthodontics. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Tony Daher with a big round of applause. And my topic for today is going to be, uh, as you see on the screen, minimally invasive prosthodontics. I'll give you some clinical per that I learned through um, many years of practice. We know that uh, with implant dentistry, uh, uh, new techniques are emerging. And you know for a fact you have sinus graft, bone growth factors, gingival graft, implant and variety of abutment, adhesive dentistry with stronger resins and porcelain, and it's predictable to certain degrees. And I want to emphasize the word certain degrees. So there is limitation to anything we do. And this new technique and data complicated our treatment planning, especially when we uh, do it with our patients. So anyone placing or restoring implant must be prepared for the possibility of potential complications. And these complications can be minor or major, reversible or irreversible, depending on uh, the case that you're doing. And it's really a concern to the dental community, and this is why you see a lot, a lot of lecture, a lot of lecturer talking about implant complication. How can we improve our daily practice? And we can say, you know, after so many years of private practice, we are still learning from our mistakes. As somebody said, Barry, the partner, good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. Failures. It can be on different level. Material selections, you know, we talk about zirconia. Zirconia can break. Acrylic teeth, resin, can break. Uh, so the problem is not only this ankylosed teeth, that we, uh, ankylosed implant that we're talking about, but also how can we control the stress. And this is why occlusion becomes a big factor in the, uh, to make our restoration long, uh, la uh, longer, to last longer. Another important factor that we forget sometimes, especially when you saw some of the cases that, that have been uh, presented to you between yesterday and today, uh, hygiene is a big factor. So our restoration has to uh, design in, in, in a way that patients can be able to clean around the implants. And some of the rest restoration that we saw between yesterday and, to, and, to, and today lacks, lacks this, uh, this type. Continuous care. Implant is something new. Patient has to understand that they have to come to your office and try to check, do a checkup and see how can we prevent uh, problems and also if there is a problem, how can we catch it and solve it in from the beginning. And certainly we know for a fact that the more you do complex dental procedures, the more complication you're going to be uh, subjected to. Reality check. When we look at the way implant education is going, we know for a fact that the number of placed implant has increased dramatically. I'm sure you have new patients, and most, you know, a big number of new patients, uh, when you examine them, they find out they have some kind of uh, uh, X number of implants. Increased number of uh, dentists, but also differences in their clinical skills. You know, the more, the more you do cases, the more you, you will acquire a clinical skill. And this is why you have to uh, 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 mature uh, your clinical skill and, your, uh, and, and will help your patient and so on. In the same time, we have fewer formal training courses. You know, to become a specialist, usually you have to go to school uh, for three years uh, post-grad, but that three years is not enough. So we have to 
be connected with multiple training courses and invest for the sake of our patients. And certainly, you make more money. But these courses mostly that are done on the weekend courses, are they enough? So it's the questions that you, that you have to uh, answer. Also, dentists are placing implants in, in compromised site using more aggressive protocol. And this is sometimes a lot of implant company will push you, say, well, the implant is gonna integrate and, uh, and it doesn't matter if the site is uh, uh, adequate or compromised and it's gonna, it's gonna work. And this is gonna create, or refer to it as a hysteria among practicing dentists. Learning and doing implant dentistry after a weekend course and forgetting classical prosthodontic principles that were tested again and again through the years. And you know, after 36 years in private practice, and these are cases, they come to my practice and, ho and try to solve it, and sometimes I cannot do, uh, I cannot do anything about it. And, and this is very common, and these are in Southern California. This is another situation here. I usually refer to it as the bleached crown syndrome. Everybody wants a white teeth. But certainly that patient got white teeth, but we forgot, we forget that, that dentists forget basic prosthodontic principle. Aesthetics, plane of occlusion, vertical dimensions, hygiene, overhangs. And this is the same patients. When you look at his smile, certainly plane of occlusion is a problem. Look at the aesthetic of his profile, it's overclosed. Look at the occlusal tables and so on. This is another one, okay? I belong to a peer review, uh, I am chairing of, uh, of a peer review committee and we see a lot of patients like that. And when we interview the dentist, they say, well, what happened here? So, well, we did, you know, he had enough money to, to take care of some of the upper teeth, but he did not have money to take care of the lower arch. So what, what is the problem here? The problem is we, you know, we like implant, and every time patients comes in, we think that that's placing implant, we're gonna make money, and, uh, and uh, you know, we, uh, we're, the patient is happy, and we, as we say, we make more money. But the thing behind it is in prosthodontics, when you look at the big picture, there are many ways to solve the case and make it into predictable uh, result. This is another peer review case. Simple, upper denture, two implant, and a lower over denture. And this one was a peer review case. Patients got really upset, the aesthetic was very bad. And what happened here? The dentist, we made the dentist give her back her money, plus the money to save, to re restore that case, to remove everything and, and start from scratch. Another situation here. This patient just got implants, full mouth rehabs, and this is six months later. He was not happy for two reasons. One reason is these posterior bridges, they came loose. They are cemented in, they come loose, they go, they cemented back, and afterwards they come back and so on. And he got really upset. Plus, who got upset really? The wife. The wife was complaining he paid around $50,000 to get his case and with an ugly smile. So they always nag on him. You paid $50,000 and your smile is still ugly. And the question I have for you here is when, you, when somebody pay you $50,000, why don't you do another two crowns on number 10 and 11? Why do we have why do we have metal showing here? Because it was an occlusion problem. The dentist has to adjust the occlusion because only the anterior teeth were touching, not the posterior teeth. So he came to me and they wanted to sue the dentist and so on, so we talked and we made a compromise between the patient and the previous dentist and we were able, if we follow basic prosthodontic principle, we can get him to a better uh, aesthetics and certainly a better function. 
Who decided on the color of his, of his uh, restorations? The wife. Very good. This is another situation. This is nine months. If I'm doing all implants on the top, all implants on the bottom, she broke that piece of porcelain, metal ceramic uh, bridge here. Now we know, uh, we talked yesterday morning uh, about, you know, you have to do a full contour wax up, make sure the porcelain is enough thickness to be able to take some, uh, some uh, stress without breaking and so on. And this is going to create a problem also. She wanted uh, to sue the dentist and so on. So we, the dentist called me, can you troubleshoot for me? I said, well, it looks to me that we have to redo everything. So he had to give her back her money, and he has to pay me to restore that, that case. And this is what you see. This is the panoramic. And this implant here, we put it to sleep. Why? Because there's a broken screw and we could not remove. And we told the patient, let's take it out. They said, no more surgery. I said, OK, we have four implants. Let's do a, a four implant uh, prosthesis. And certainly in my practice, an informed consent. And we give her all this and so on. So we put, uh, it's not my problem anymore. It becomes the patient's problem. And when you look, when you take everything out, and this implant, the direction of these implants. Do you like this angulation? How can we restore it? Now, if you're going to remove all this implant, what's going to happen? Bone, bone uh, you're going to take a lot of bone. Sinus is going to get involved, and so on. So we have to we show that to the patients. We make sure that the patient understands the problem, and so on. Look at the angulations. We're talking about 25 on this, uh, 45 on one and 25 on the other one between these two anterior implants. We're talking about 70 degree difference. So bottom one, the same thing. So I was fortunate, I said, well, we're going to work with what we have. So we end up doing custom abutments. Always I have to do a provisional stage. The provisional state, I learned it from my mentor, Dr. Cradoville at UCLA. This is the blueprint of the final. Sometimes I have to do two or three different sets of provisionals, make sure everything is correct, not only the aesthetic, but also the function. The type of occlusal scheme that you're going to be giving to the final restoration has to be placed on this provisional, and you test it. You test it with the patients. You test it with any family member and so on. And then afterwards from that, we can uh, cross mount all these uh, casts together and make our final uh, restorations. And here, I like in this situation, especially when you're dealing with less implant, to use the MU abutment. Dentist has this MU abutment. Why? Dr. Bernamark was smart. He told us that if you connect the prosthesis to the implant, you're going to put a lot of stress on that connecting screw. If that connecting screw is torque and it break, good luck to remove it. And this is why he ended up, do, uh, he ended up designing a, uh, a, an MU abutment. And that MU abutment, it's uh, secured on, over the implant with a good thick screw. But the prosthesis is secured to that MU abutment with a small screw. So if there is a high stress area, what is going to break? That small screw. Very simple. If you document the size of that MU abutment and you cannot remove that piece of screw, what do you do? Remove it, toss it, order a new one, and the prosthesis will, will live longer. And this is the final CAT CAM zirconia prosthesis. And this is the final x rays. And the cost of that treatment for a whole year, I think it was a year and a half, no. and 65,000 yeah. plus what the dentist lost, and he found the money, so he, had, he, had, he lost Harvard. around $100,000. OK, lie down and move your teeth forward. Back and forward, back and forward. And sideways. 
bite all the way in the back, and now move sideways. Move the other way, and the other way. You know, for the fact that we have, we deal with three different types of occlusal scheme, anterior guided occlusion, group function, and balance mm -hmm. occlusion. One is a full fix, and, and the material is very so solid. You can go with anterior guided occlusion. Sometimes, if you want, you can do group function. When, an upper, when one of the arch is a denture, then we have to do a balanced type of occlusion. So can this be prevented? Certainly, you have to know your limitation. I learned the hard way. And this is why sometimes if I cannot do it, I said, well, I cannot do it. You have to go somewhere who can do it. Certainly, you have to improve your skill, your skills. I've been, I paid a lot of money to improve my skills, being, going on a hands-on courses, attending a lot of meetings, and so on. So this is a very important thing. Learn complete mouth rehabilitation prosthodontics principles first before learning implant surgery principle. I found out that everybody wants to learn the surgical, uh, how to place an implant. But the thing behind it is patients not gonna see the implant, they're gonna see the prosthesis. They wanna live with it, they wanna smile. And any problems gonna happen is because it's, it's a bad prosthesis. So many options available in prosthodontics. You know, we have fixed, we have removable partial or removable uh, complete prosthodontics, or sometimes combination of fixed and removable prosthodontics. Any type of prosthesis you're gonna be doing has to have a good outcome. We have the mean to give patients a good outcome. Remember, patients wants to know how much that treatment is gonna cost. Also, a patient wants to know how long that treatment is gonna be. My worst patients, I usually tell everybody, medical doctor. Medical doctors, they have the money, but they don't have the time. And they want the best. And every time I give an appointment, they want an appointment after five o'clock or on a weekend. And when I give them an appointment on the weekend, what do they do? Call me, I have an emergency. So these are important things. Remember, in, in, in implant, we have sometimes a couple of bone grafting sessions, and we have to wait uh, five to six months in every bone grafting we do. What type of te temporary prosthesis are you gonna be doing? Are they available in case that temporary prosthesis break? And so on and so on. So treatment sometimes, I have patients been treated for two years in my practice. So it's very important to, when you present treatment planning, you have to involve not only the money, but also the time to be able to finish that treatment plan. Most of the time, you have to give alternative treatment. Psychological studies showing that don't do it more than three alternatives. And most patients will select the second one. So the second one has to be within your skills. And, and this is how things will get better. Patients like that have been wearing complete denture for so many years. Now she has some money to improve her smile. She came to me, but not a lot of money. So can we do predictable, complete dentures? Yes. With little amount of money, with, with fixing the, the, uh, the support area, then $10,000, she can have a nice smile, and she's going to look really younger. Another situation, do you think dentures are, you never do dentures, they can always stay loose? Smile. I'll show you, this is before. Up and down. Up she and has down. porcelain teeth. Left and right. And when she moves left and right, everything tap, tap. loose. Tap, tap. And up and down, up and down, tap, tap. If you ask the technician yeah. to do setup, and grind left and right. Most and of forward. your technicians are gonna do a class one skeletal setup. But class one scale of setup is for natural teeth, not for completed dentures patients. So we have to design an occlusal scheme to be a biomechanical acceptable. And this is before and this is after. And we have two different occlusal schemes that we teach. This is a linear occlusion that Dr. Flush in 1960 designed it. 
and it works very well. Flat on the top, bladed porcelain teeth on the bottom. But the biggest thing is no centric contact between 6 and 11, and no vertical overlap. Right now, you see right. all the contacts are in yeah, the back, right. retracting the lips and the cheeks. Yes, back and, and ask forward, the patient to move left and right. Left, right. Very stable. All around now. Can you all do around. that? Okay, very good. Now open wide. Over there. Now that right. right. Tap, tap. And slide. And you see no all center around. contact on interior teeth, all no around. vertical overlap. But when Keep the patients move forward, there is a very forward. slight contact between the anterior forward, teeth. Back and forth, back and forth, slide all around. Very good. Now people say, well, this is not a good aesthetic a setup, smile. and patients are going to be able to incise and so on. But let me show you when she smiles and when she talks. Do you see that? You're not, not going to see that patient has that uh, no centric stop and no vertical overlap. You have to know anatomy of how to border mold, be able to get the border in the right to here, extension so you get a good suction. You need to smile. No, I am bloody smiling. <laughs> you want to show me some teeth. Okay. Turn it a little bit your head towards me. Can you tell if she doesn't have any centric contact between 6 okay, and 11? Can I say Mississippi? Can you tell if she doesn't have no vertical overlap? 55. Mississippi. Mississippi. Very fine. Very fine. Mississippi. Mississippi. Another situation here. Patients come to me, I referred by another patient. He has pain. Okay, this is the pain here, and you see it. And also we talk what other problem you have and so on. So he said, I cannot floss on that bridge, foot trap under my bridge. I heard about implant and I want some implant and no pain. Now certainly when you look at this, it's very simple. You know, if you are a, couple, a tooth doctor, then you say we'll do a root canal, do a couple of crowns, a filling, and uh, we just take that bridge off, put an implant, and, uh, and make two single crowns. The question is, when you have this, now you're gonna say, well, you already have a bridge. Can you improve on the bridge? What does the retrospective studies told us uh, on is the fixed three unit bridge, does it last longer than a single implant replacement? Dr. Gugelaker tabulated all this retrospective study and he said that if you're gonna do bone grafting and gingival graft and all this stuff to be able to put an implant versus making a three unit bridge, you're gonna deal with more complication on that single implant than making a three unit bridge. Now, if you, there is no bone grafting, no gingival graft, just straightforward, you place the implant, longevity mostly is the same as a regular bridge and, and a, a single implant tooth. Now, certainly if the two teeth on each side of that edential space is natural teeth, the first choice is to place an implant. But if, had, if the abutment teeth, they have already crowns, then you have to uh, do that gymnastic. Looking at the full mouth x-ray, good, but it has some inadequate root canal and so on. So we make a problem list. And then we look at the stress factor, the type of occlusal scheme they're gonna be. Can we improve on that? And this is our responsibility to do that evaluation. Remember, any prosthesis you do, if you put it on a tabletop, it will last forever. But once that prosthesis is placed in the mouth, there is a stress factor, hygiene factor, and so on. So look at it. This is a group function, right? Group function here. And there's another one here, but there's no contact, but there is a, a, a non-working contact on the second molar, okay? And this is the left working. So it's very important to look at that. But at the same time, when you look at the centric, there's no contact between 6 and 11. Do we need a contact between 6 and 11? Yes, because proprioception. These anterior teeth are far away from the, le from the uh, lever, ar lever arm. 
So it's important, these front teeth, they're gonna protect the back. We wanna decrease the amount of wear on the posterior teeth. And these posterior teeth are very close to the masseter, so they're gonna be subjected to a lot of stress. So we make a problem list, and I show the patients. You know, we have some photos, we have series of photos, and this is what during the treatment plan. Once we have this problem list, the next question I'm asking the patient, which problem do you want me to fix? How many patients will tell you just fix the two bottom, or the two top, or the two middle? All patients are gonna tell you fix all the problem. I want a healthy mouth. Now, the nice thing about prostatonic is with, we can treat it as what? Either full fix, expensive, or sometimes a combination, or sometimes a removal. So, they, but the final destination is gonna be predictable, depending on the amount of money that patient wants to invest and the time that they wanna invest. Look at that occlusion. Side. This one, this one. Do it again. You hear that? I did not mention that this is a problem for him. But while I'm examining the occlusion, this is what happened. Okay, he's mostly concerned about two things. Pain on the lower right uh, arch, and mm -hmm. he wants to get rid of that bridge. But now he understands why he has that problem, and because there is no contact between 6 and 11. So now that situation becomes looking at the big picture. How are we going to fix this and also address his chief complaint? So occlusion scheme here, occlusion has to be fixed. For us, it's a pathological type of occlusion. So now, how can we get contact between 6 and 11? If you want to make a lot of money, then certainly you can start doing veneers or crown and so on. But in prosthodontics, if we just decrease the vertical dimension until we have contacts on the, on the canine, certainly it will be a good option for that patient, and it's going to be less money. Now, certainly, when looking at these crowns, the posterior crowns, they have to be redone. So we talk about it and so on. So we, I do a diagnostic, uh, a diagnostic uh, situation here. We take impressions, and we need to find the right position of his mandibular arch. And because of his uh, inadequate occlusion, he is, he's, he's fighting me. I could not get my retruded contact position. So what we did is the Lucia jig. Lucia jig, it's since Dr. Lucia designed it long time ago in, in the 60s. And it's mostly you place it and ask the patients to move forward, back, left, and right. And this is some kind of a deep program for the jaw. And this will give me exactly where that vertical, uh, where that centric position of the matter is going to be. So I go ahead, and you see that gothic arch tracing, and we know exactly where that retruded contact position is the apex of that gothic arch tracing. So we go ahead and mount these casts on a semi-adjustable articulator, and now how can we bring a contact between the 6 and 11? So what we did is we do pindex. So I pindex the molar, pindex the premolar, I take the molars out, the vertical dimension will close, take the premolar out, and suddenly we start having a contact on a 6 and 11. So with a little bit of enamoplasty, we get a nice contact between 6 and 11. I, asked, I moved my articulator to get an occlusal scheme, uh, acceptable anterior guided occlusion. Uh, we do it. We do equilibration on his existing crown to get the canine contacts and then make an impressions and make a first set of provisional crowns. And then certainly we send that patient to endodontist to, do, to re retreat all the into. And I use two sets of provisionals, one to be able to build up, do a post build up to the right size. So I hollow the occlusal surface it uses as a matrix and I do my post build ups with amalgam on all these root canal treated. And then very simple afterwards, you do your crown and bridge. 
And then while we place the implant, while the implant is getting integrated, we're going to try to finish uh, the restorations. I still, on my posterior teeth, I still use a metal collar to get a better uh, closing the gap, as we say. And then certainly we follow the same criteria, full diagnostic wax up, cut it back, make a wax, frame, wax um, uh, make a metal frame, metal frame, and then bake porcelain, and we finish the situation. And this is in final destination. We still have a group function, but the canine are there. And this is final smile, and you see the, the anterior teeth now in contact, and, and certainly in these situations, we, um, we make a night guard. It's a good investment uh, for him. Another situation here, this is a fireman. He got an accident at work. He broke his skull and also his uh, jaws. So he went in rehabilitation, surgery, and so on for the past two, three years. And this is how I got it. He wanted to restore his anterior uh, tear, the aesthetic zone. Now he comes in, before he removes this, I check his occlusion, and uh, we said, call the medical doctor uh, and tell him, okay, it's time to remove this, so let me take care of that patient. And the question is, we know for a fact that the aesthetic zone is the hardest to treat, but we have what? We have two teeth missing, and we have a big bony defect, soft and hard de defect on both arches. So now, as a prosthodontist, I want to know if the bone grafting is going to be predictable to, for that guy. The guy went into multiple surgery. Now, when I talk about bone grafting and when he hears the word surgery, then he really got upset. I said, I don't want to know surgery. But for me, as a prosthodontist, I want to know if any, any uh, procedure done by a surgeon, how predictable it's going to be because I want to know where that bone graft is going to be after, perhaps after five years. And the problem with academic and the literature, sometimes these bone grafting articles are, are published after a year, sometimes two years. At the most, you will find five years and on. And on. So what's going to happen with these bone grafts? And, you know, I have to make sure that patients, my prosthesis lasts. So Dr. Buckley here, I learned it from him, you divide that, that uh, rich defect into low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. And this is how we do. Now, certainly, I prefer to have a low risk type of rich defect. So, so when you do the surgery, certainly it's going to get a little bit better predictable and so on. So, so these are the important things to learn. I don't do surgery, but I have to know that. And looking at the literature, and the best article is when you're dealing with a randomized clinical trials. And we found out for horizontal bone uh, uh, procedures, there's only three randomized clinical trials on 106 patients. On a, for a ver vertical bone grafting, 10, and on 218. And what, when you're looking at tabulating all these papers, the techniques, it depends on the technique they use multiple different technique, orthodontic movement, only block, bone plate, titanium mesh, distracting oste osteogenesis. The question is I have for you, when there are so many different techniques of bone grafting, what does it mean? None is 100% predictable. So, and the material that's been used, autogenous graft, bone substitute, biology, you know, and so on. So summary, many techniques can augment horizontally and vertically with limitations. And certainly it's unclear which technique is best. And this is why you see many different lectures, different technique on bone grafting and so on. So every technique has a drawback. And this is mostly, some papers tell us that for example, GBR, seven papers, highly technique sensitive. So you have to be skillful in doing that. Distraction osteogenesis, 13 paper, high complication rates. Even sometimes you, you're the sloughing of that piece of bone that you try to move. Only bone graft, five papers, limited da data. 
Other three papers also give you three limited data. Bone augmentation may not increase implant survival from a conclusion perspective. I need to know that because I need to explain that to the patients. We know for a fact that better outcome to place implant in a matured bone. And this is why a lot of, a lot of people are talking the all on four concept because you put it on matured bone. Defects occur in three dimensions. When you do bone grafting, the defect can be in three dimensions. Implant complications are common and should be expected. No grafting, only 18%. But with grafting, when you look at this paper, it's 61%. So staging multiple low-risk procedures will decrease the risk of reconstructions in difficult cases. So it's very important. Somebody said, keep it simple is good. For that patient, when I talked to him about all this, then he said, well, the best thing to do with, is to do what? A four unit fixed partial denture. So we start preparing because I tell him that it's not clear if bone augmentation has clinical benefits over alternative treatment. And this is why we start doing a regular fixed prosthodontics technique with a little bit of pink porcelain in between. Okay? And this is, and then we adjust the occlusion and get you an anterior guided occlusion. And this is before, and this is after. And this is nine years. Nine years post up checkup. Can you guarantee that the bone graft that you have after nine years is gonna be there? So if we have to use a little pink after a bone graft procedures, might as well sometimes use a lot of pink and don't do that grafting procedures. Because I want to do something predictable for that patient, minimize complications. Another thing, and this is what I have seen. Company will tell us that removal prostolonic does not work, implant are the best treatment of choice, right? Now, the problem is, I want to move forward, this is, I don't have time. A recent graduate, we fail in undergraduate to teach how to make removal partial denture. Removal partial denture is a complete mouth rehab, so you have to look at it big picture. And Dr. Bassi here, he did a study on 40 patients only one patient wanted implant. All the others, all the other wanted some kind of different prosthesis. Five percent of partially dentulous patients would be restored with the implant therapy. And we have a bad thing about partials. You know, these clasp assembly will extract the abutment, and this is why we say, "Little partial denture, don't you cry? You'll be a full denture by and by." So, but when you look at the literature. With minimally designed RPD, you can have a nice uh, outcome. And the result is at least 74% of the RPD that you're going to be doing, they're going to be accepted by the patients. So it is a consensus among prostolonists that 74% of patients are satisfied with RPDs. And show you the case very fast. Okay, the upper denture we're going to clean up. I don't do clasps. Are going to be attachment. Simple attachment with the implant. We do it. Basic prosthetic principle: complete, complete uh, contour, final. And certainly, sometimes you have to uh, do a root canal, but before and after. And you get the nice, with less amount of money and less amount of time. I want to show you this. Another thing, you know, placing implant will increase the number of teeth. We can do a nice implant over denture, partial denture. So these are ways to do it, and your outcome will be much better, least amount of money, least amount of time. And these are removable fixed bridges. I call them removable fixed bridges for the patients. Easy to clean, easy to maintain our implant teeth supported. I like to keep teeth as much as possible because they have proprioception. This is going to regulate the amount of stress on this restoration. Another situation, if you're going to build that ridge, it takes so much energy to build up. Just place a couple of implants and connect them with the bar, 
And then with the flange, you get that lip support. And now you have a prosthesis that is going to secure positive rest on the molars, positive rest on the bar, and the clip will last longer, and you have a nice outcome. In summary, RPD can still be an optimum alternative treatment for partially denaturous situations when complex grafting and implant procedures are needed to restore this situation with fixed prosthetics. RPD treatment provides a good outcome. Think about it, and I think you have to place it. And it's very easy to learn the minimal standard of RPD design. In the end, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And remember, we have implant treatment available for our patient, but also remember that basic prosthodontic principles are important for the sake of a good outcome. Thank you.